So as many of you will know if you watched some of my recent videos, I built myself um, a reflow controller um, that was controlled by an Android tablet. Um, I built that uh, several months ago and I've just decided uh, finally to build a case for it. I mean there are many reasons for, for building a case. I mean obviously um, this, the obvious one with this board is that it's actually mains powered and um, there's a safety issue with having the, um, the board exposed uh, like this all the time even though it's being controlled remotely and you know I'm a grown up I'm not likely to reach out and touch any of the live parts. It does make sense to enclose it in, um, in a case. Um, and also, I want to keep the thing free from damage and contaminants because I'm using, I'm not using this in, in a, you know, a clean room. I'm using this basically in my garage, um, and I want to keep you know, gunge off it and keep it looking nice and fresh. So in this video, I'm going to try. I'm going to go through and try to explain to you um, the process I went through in um, in building a case, you know, the thought processes, and what I actually uh, came up with in the end, and we'll see um, how I get on. One obvious way of building a case is just to buy a pre-shaped, um, a pre-formed project box of the kind you can see on eBay um, and use your own tools to work it to your own specifications and then mount the thing inside it. Now I've tried that before and, re and I really don't have the tools or, or really the skills to be able to work something um, like that into, into a professional looking um, case. I've tried it before and I made a complete mess of it so I've decided um, I wasn't going to do that. Um, and that which meant really getting a custom enclosure built. I mean, you can you can design custom enclosures and have them uh, built for you by by companies. There are there are not many around that will do it, and they're really quite expensive to have uh, have it have something built to your own spec. So I decided to use the uh, one of the new labs that has uh, sprung up over the last few years to support the maker community, and build myself um, an, an acrylic case. Basically, I designed the case using um, a CAD program on the computer. And I just send the CAD design off to this uh, this lab. Basically, they'll use then use a CO2 laser to cut acrylic to my specifications. Um, send me the pieces back, and with a bit of luck, they'll all fit together and form a case. So here's my basic um, drawing plan for the case. I thought, well, my drawings are hopeless. Let's see what I can do here. So presumably, I can manage to draw something that's roughly case shaped. And there we go. Let's draw the inner lines as the inner line there is dotted. So the idea is that um, because the uh, all of the exit points from the um, device are on this side, I would have you know um, outlets here for switches, sockets, and whatnot. They will all be, all be mounted on this inside down here. And because the mains um, the mains parts are mounted at the back, particularly the the, uh, the triac here um, is the part that uh, potentially could get hot. I decided that I'd put uh, a fan hole at the back here, so I can have a little uh, 40 millimeter fan mounted at the back. Now, the main um, program that I think hobbyists use for doing um, this kind of maker activity is something called Inkscape. It's free, and it's um, it's quite easy to use actually. I didn't find it particularly difficult to get the hang of. Um, but uh, starting from scratch, do a case like this would have taken a very long time. So I use an online program, which you can see a snapshot of right here on the screen, called uh, Maker Case. Now Maker Case is a very useful online facility where you can just put in the dimensions and specs of your case, hit a button and it'll produce an SVG file for you. Um, that's saved me many, many hours um, and I, th I think I recommend it to anybody. Um, what it outputs isn't actually uh, ready to go to the, to the uh, design bureau. Normally you'll have to tailor it to your own, to your own uh, requirements, but it does get you off to a flying start. And you can see here um, a screenshot from um, Inkscape where my design is now ready uh, with all the um, screw holes in it, the holes and everything. It's all ready to be um, sent off to um, the, the, the uh, design bureau for uh, manufacturing. Now the design bureau I use is called Razor Lab. Um, there are, they are, it says on their website, powered by Panoco. You can see a screenshot here. Panoco is a well-known um, laser, uh, laser cutting service in the US and Razor Lab appears to be their uh, European, well, their UK outlet. So I uploaded my design to their um, site and it took a very long time to be, um, to, to actually come ready to uh, be cut. But um, it was uh, time worth waiting for, I think, because uh, when the uh, design arrived, I was in a position to be actually ready to build it and make this video and show you it all. Okay, so my order from Razor Labs has finally arrived and um, here it is, ready for unboxing. Um, all I've done so far is snip the ends of the tape here and, uh, and black out then to peel off part of the address label. So the, for packaging, what they've done is just take two pieces of cardboard 
and wrap them um, round in opposite directions. One piece goes round in that direction and the other piece is inside and goes round in the opposite direction. To be honest, I would prefer to have seen my order arrive in an actual box because if you look in here, I can actually see the edges of my cut pieces of, of perspex. I'm not particularly impressed with that. And same at the other end as well, you can, you can actually see into it. I, I, I think I'd much rather prefer to see you know, it in a box with some padding or even a, you know, a padded bag. Um, it remains to see whether it survived the, um, the journey. I'm sure it has, but let's, let's have a look. Right, let's get this thing out of the box and see what we've got in here. It's like we can just slide this out the side because I've already trimmed the tape. says hopefully. Actually I'm just going to cut the box. Now being somewhat careful because I know my orders in here I'll just slice the top part which I know is protected by more card inside and there we go. Let's have a look. Oh yes lots of pieces of plastic sticking out of the side. I'll move this waste and here we are. Excellent, they've left on the protective um, plastic that covers the, the pieces of perspex. Now there are two designs in here, um, but the one we're interested in here is the design for my, um, uh, my uh, reflow oven case. So I'll just place aside the parts that I know are for the other design, which we'll look at later. And the most important thing here is that they've left the, uh, the protective covering on for the, um, for the perspex. Um, that's really nice, that's really nice. Oh, and it's actually proper perspex as well. It's not any kind of imitation, it's the real deal. Um, so when the laser was used to uh, cut this, this perspex, um, it went through both the uh, protective layer and the perspex in between. Well, it seems I might have made a newbie mistake. Um, that's, if you hold these two pieces up, these are uh, basically interlocking um, interlocking sides, and the idea is that these these pieces will um, fit together like like so, and you have the captive screws that go in these slots here. And as you can see, it's kind of tight. It's kind of more than tight, actually. I think it's a bit too a bit too close. I probably for you see, I can force them in like so, but. I don't think that's particularly sustainable. You want them to be snug, but you don't want them to be so tight that if you push really hard, you know, if I push these really hard to make them fit, there's a good chance I'll crack the, the um, acrylic. Um, now what's what's happened here is uh, it's, it's basically, um, you know, the difference between I the um, ideal measurements and the uh, actual uh, fact of um, engineering. When you do your design in the SVG, you're using infinitely thin lines to um, draw your design, but the laser itself has a defined thickness. And the beam thickness for this particular laser is 0.2 millimeters. And um, I, in the Maker Case program, I did use the facility to set what's called the kerf, which is the amount of um, material that you estimate the laser will burn up as it moves through the material. And I did set that based on the laser width of 0.2 millimeters, so I thought I'd accounted for this. But me being a complete newbie must uh, have obviously made a little bit of a miscalculation because they are super tight, those edges. So what I'm going to go and do now is um, I think I can just get away with just a light amount of filing or perhaps sanding at the edges here to make these fit um, because it's really, really close. Um, so I'll go away and do that now while this protective uh, plastic is still in place over the top of the acrylic. Um, and I'll come back with hopefully some uh, pieces that fit um, nice and snugly together without being forced into position. Right, I've got a little confession to make. Um, when I got the uh, protective uh, backing off these pieces of plastic, it actually turned out that they were quite easy to put together. I don't know whether that had anything to do with it or whether they were just easier to handle um, because the, the backing was off. Um, but I, I couldn't bring myself to file down these these um, edges here. It would have it would have scuffed them, and the, the, the laser finish is really quite nice. So um, they they do fit together. They are quite tight, which is nice. You don't want them to be loose. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and fit the rest of the case together now, um, and I'll just give you a quick introduction to the parts that I'll need to be able to do that. 
Right, so starting on the side here, I've got um, the mains inlet here, which is switched and fused. Fuses are not really necessary in the UK um, in, on a, on a um, device because they, the plugs themselves are fused, but this thing comes with one and it's I actually got one fitted inside it. So that will go into there, like so. We have the oven outlet connector here, that'll fit there, like so. Um, we have the rotary encoder here, that will fit on the side through there and be mounted and held on from the outside and the button will be fitted on, on a knob will be fitted on the uh, end of the um, shaft there. There's a hole here for the outlet of the thermocouple wire and there's some holes in the bottom of the case here to, that I can use to um, hold down the wires that come from the board with some pieces of um, uh, some wire that'll just, that'll just coil around and, and trap the wire coming from the board to the base of the case. At the back here I have a, a Gellied Silent 4 fan and that's used, that's positioned so that it will be directly next to the triac and it'll um, extract the uh, hot air from the, um, from the heatsink that covers the triac. And for fixtures and fittings I've got some M3 screws. The, these, these metal screws I'll use, um, I'll use these for the uh, fan and for holding the actual case together I've got acrylic captive screws. Um, I'll show you these when I put it together and there are some close-up photographs on my uh, website because um, these, these uh, captive screws are key to how the case is actually held together. I don't believe it, I've gone and broken my Gellid Silent 4 fan. What I was doing was just um, testing it to see which way the blades uh, were sp would, would spin when it was connected up by connecting um, my bench power supply to the little connector here. I looked up the pinout on the internet um, and even with the pinout right in front of me I still managed to get um, part the power and ground connections reversed and this fan does not like that. It just um, f frankly flat out fails to work now. Um, the reason for the fail obviously is probably not the fact that the motor got uh, a reverse charge, I don't think the motor particularly cares, but there's um, a little integrated circuit board under there because this is a, this is a PWM fan and the, um, the circuit board obviously has uh, problems with being connected in reverse polarity, it's not protected against it and this fan is now broken. So I'm afraid that's out and in its place I've got um, a Xylance fan. I would have used another Gellid obviously because it fits the case perfectly but I couldn't seem to get one on eBay, they seem to have um, just been sold out everywhere and you know in short supply. So the, the Xylance one will do nicely. Um, it, the, the, the screw holes for mounting still fit perfectly. The only difference is that these struts that connect to the outside will no longer line up with the struts on the case. But that's just a small price to pay I suppose. Right, let's see if I can put this thing together without breaking anything else. Here it is, all assembled. Um, it took a bit longer than I expected, uh, probably about three hours actually. Mainly uh, time spent um, you know, cutting, um, trimming and uh, preparing the, the, mains and the mains wiring here. I wanted to do a good job there obviously because it's, um, it's safety critical and I wanted everything to be working well. Um, it was mostly mishap free except uh, for one little, one little mistake I made. There's a crack there in the case. Um, which was which happened whilst I was uh, pressing down the um, the top part of the case here, the last piece, because the last piece is the hardest to fit because it's got it's got to um, mate with all four sides here. And while pressing down, I think I was a little bit too enthusiastic around the back here, and it cracked, and it's so annoying. But at least it's round the back where you can hardly see it. It doesn't affect the structural integrity of the case at all. The case itself has a very nice solid feel to it. I'm actually really impressed with the way these uh, captive um, captive nuts and screws work. Um, it's all um, come together rather nicely and feels very solid. I think I was quite justified in uh, choosing the 5mm acrylic over the 3mm. Because um, this has come out really, really nice and solid. I quite like it. Um, it it's, doing, it's done really well. So I know you all want to see whether it actually switches on or not, whether I've broken anything else during the fitting. You know, I broke the fan. Um, the Xylance fan is in there now in its place and um, does work well. Let's plug the power in and see what happens. So in with the IEC C14 connector there and um, switch it on. Bingo, she works. There's the Nokia display lighting up there. It says no link because I haven't switched on the, uh, the you know, any Bluetooth um, connection from uh, one of my tablets. So the um, HC06 is just blinking away there, waiting for a connection as it does. The fan at the back is spinning. I can hear it. You may just be able to hear a slight whirring. 
Maybe it doesn't come through on the video, but I can just hear it here. The fan's set to draw air in from the outside and blow it onto the um, heatsink there. I've never actually noticed the heatsink get warm um, at all when I've been using this um, device without the case. But with a case, obviously, the airflow is restricted, and so it does make sense just to have a little, air, you know, a little uh, forced air um, from a fan there to make sure that um, nothing hot builds up around the heatsink. Obviously, don't go touching the heatsink when it's switched on. That's part of the main circuitry. Um, if you want to uh, probe your design to see whether it's um, getting too hot, use use um, a, a thermocouple that you can attach to the heatsink and use hands-free while you're um, taking measurements. Well, let's just have a quick play with the rotary encoder to make sure that's all working. The encoder features um, a button on it, so you um, activate the, the menu in my uh, firmware by pressing the rotary encoder, which clicks the button. Then you can get through to the menus. They all seem to be working. That's nice. We can go um, navigate through, navigate through the options. I've built the firmware um, so it doesn't need a back button. You just um, don't do anything for a few seconds and then it'll revert back to the main menu there. So um, yeah, it's all looking nice. It's all looking good indeed. I'm very pleased with that. So I think that's all I've got to say really. Um, everything is, uh, is working as I designed it to be. It's all, it's all very nice. And I'm going to be using this hopefully for years to come in my um, reflow projects. So obviously there's a blog article to accompany this. Please visit my website. Um, have a look at the blog article where you can see high-res photographs. And um, if you're planning to build this, all of the um, details that you, you need are there. The designs, all the, the, the uh, component list, bill of materials, it's all there for you. So um, please head on over to the blog. And um, this has been a fun video. I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.